Skill Up TOEFL Junior Advanced, produced and copyrighted by WorldCom Edu. Practice Test 1. Number 1. Listen to a principal making an announcement. With summer officially starting next week, I'd like to remind you all of the school sun smart policy. During recess and lunchtime, as well as during physical education classes outside, all students must wear a hat or cap. If you forget to bring a hat, there are some spares available in the staff room. Have a good weekend and see you next week. What is the purpose of the announcement? Number 2. Listen to a teacher talking to a class. It's Friday afternoon, everyone, and that means it's time to clean the classroom. Could students in the front row take the trash out to the dumpster? Second row students pick up any trash that's on the floor. The third row, you're responsible for putting everything away, and the fourth row for wiping down the tables and windows. Let's get busy. What will students probably do next? Questions 3 through 6. Listen to a conversation between a student and a teacher at school. Mrs. Collar, can we go out and play hockey this afternoon on the new hockey field? Maybe, Francis. If we study hard this morning, we should be able to go out in the afternoon. By the way, I didn't know that you liked hockey. Before, I didn't like it, but after they made the new hockey field, I started to like it a lot more. When I look at the field, I just want to go and play on it. It's so wonderful. It is a very beautiful field. Our school is very lucky to have it. Mrs. Collar, I was wondering something. I like the new hockey field. I like the perfect synthetic grass. But why do they need to bring in synthetic grass? Why don't the gardeners just grow some beautiful natural green grass to play on instead? That's a great question. And one of the reasons is because of the seasons. The seasons? Yes, because it's so cold in winter, a lot of the grass dies, and sometimes there's not enough rain in the other months. So the natural grass really doesn't have a chance to be perfect. Also, when we play hockey on there, with everyone running around and hitting the puck, the grass gets dug up and cut up. It won't grow again very easily. So we have synthetic grass. Thanks for the explanation. I do like real grass, but I like synthetic grass a lot also. Now answer the questions. Number 3. What is the main topic of the conversation? Number 4. When did Francis become interested in hockey? Number 5. What might Francis do in the afternoon? Number 6. According to the passage, why don't the gardeners grow natural grass? Questions 7 through 11. Listen to a teacher talking in a class. Let us now talk about economics and what governments try to do to help their people have the best possible situation economically. If an economy is going well, that's good news. It probably means that the government is doing a good job. But if it is not going strongly, there have traditionally been two main ways governments have tried to step in and help. One of those ways is called fiscal policy. In fiscal policy, governments spend money on various projects, possibly more money than they normally would. They might build a road, or they might fix up a stadium, employ more people, or spend money on any number of things. The economist John Keynes was a big fan of this idea. One of the quotes he is remembered for is, Governments should pay people to dig a hole, and then pay them to fill it back up again. This would be an example of employing fiscal policy. Governments also use monetary policy to help their societies. This refers to them toggling with the amount of money in the society and with interest rates. If they print more money, this can be a good thing in the sense that more money is available to spend. It can also be a bad thing because that money might now be worth a little less. Governments are always trying to use a mixture of these two policies in order to improve their societies, to help more people find jobs and opportunities so the economy ultimately thrives. Now answer the questions. Number 7. What is the main theme of the lecture? Number 8. According to the teacher, what method involves toggling with the interest rates? Number 9. 
According to the teacher, what method involves spending money on projects? Number 10. Why was John Keynes mentioned in the discussion? Number 11. Which was not an example of fiscal policy mentioned by the teacher? Practice test 2. Number 1. Listen to a principal making an announcement at school. As everyone knows, There are some colds and the flu going around at the moment. Therefore, I'd like to remind you all to wash your hands more often. There are taps in the bathrooms as well as outside some classrooms. And we've put in some antiseptic soap for you to use. Let's try to stay healthy. What is the purpose of the announcement? Number two, listen to a principal making an announcement at school. The uniform policy at school is that we wear uniforms at all times, even when traveling to and from school. Some local residents have called the school recently and noticed some of our students looking untidy. Please remember to keep your jackets on, your ties done up, and shirts tucked in. Thank you. What is the subject of the announcement? Questions 3 through 6. Listen to a conversation between a student and a teacher at school. All right, John, have you ever tied a knot before? I sure have, Mrs. Raymond. I tie my shoes all the time. Most people know how to tie that knot. It's called the shoelace knot or the bow knot. It's one of the most common knots in the world. It's great for tying shoes and presents. You can tie it both loose and tight. And you can double it over if you want it really tight. But do you know that in shipping or building or construction, there are many other kinds of knots? I have some idea about that, but I don't really know any of them. I've just seen some of the knots you've made in class. By the way, how did you learn to tie so many knots? When I was young, a little bit older than you, I used to work on a fishing boat. And on the fishing boat, we had to tie the boat up to the port, and that needed knots. Or we had to tie fishing lines or boxes or nets, and all those things needed knots. The captain was my uncle's friend. He taught me how to tie lots of knots. Do you want to learn one knot? Yes, please. All right, it's a pretty easy one. It's called the reef knot. It has a fishing name. It does. So pick up that piece of string. Now answer the questions. Number three. What is the subject of the conversation? Number four. According to the teacher, what is true about the shoelace knot? Number five. What will the student probably do next? Number six. What do we know about the boat captain? Questions seven through eleven. Listen to a teacher talking in a science class. Today, we're going to be talking about soil. Soil, the thin, fertile layer of mineral and organic deposits that forms the top part of the Earth's crust, is complex. It gets created very slowly, over hundreds and thousands of millennia, by a variety of geological processes. The creation of soil from rock happens through a process called weathering. Weathering is the breaking up of rock into smaller pieces. Soil scientists distinguish three important types of weathering. The first is mechanical weathering, which refers to the action of external forces, such as wind, rain, hail, and ice, as well as the extremes of heat and cold. The second, chemical weathering, involves the interaction of rocks and minerals with external gases and liquids, particularly the ones containing carbon dioxide and oxygen. It also includes interaction with acids from rocks. The third and final form, spontaneous weathering, is quite a bit different. It is a process that takes quite a lengthy span of time. It is the final disintegration of minerals into separate crystals. Once weathering has taken place, erosion can carry away the small surface particles of the bigger pieces of rock. These get carried off by wind. Water and gravity, and eventually they settle at the lowest point available. In its fully mature state, soil consists of five major components mineral matter, organic matter, water, air, and living things. The organic matter in the Earth's soil 
comes from the remains of the many plants and animals for which the soil serves as home. All of these rework oxygen and nutrients into the soil and all get decomposed by microorganisms in the soil. Mineral matter and organic matter together make up the solid part of the soil. The gaps in between act as tiny containers that allow for water and air to be held. Soil might seem a simple thing at first, but it's not. It is something we rely on and something that has been forming over millions of years. Now answer the questions. Number 7. What is the lecture mainly about? Number 8. According to the lecture, what does weathering do? Number 9. What is not mentioned as a factor in mechanical weathering? Number 10. What is not mentioned as one of the five major components of soil? Number 11. According to the lecture, what makes up the solid part of the soil? Actual test set 1. This is the listening section of the TOEFL Junior Practice Test. The listening section has 42 questions. Follow along as you listen to the directions to the listening comprehension section. Directions. In this section of the test, you will hear a teacher or other school staff member talking to students. Each talk is followed by one question. Choose the best answer to each question and mark the letter of the correct answer on your answer sheet. You will hear each talk only one time. Here is an example. Listen to a principal making an announcement. With summer officially starting next week, I'd like to remind you all of the school sun smart policy. During recess and lunchtime, as well as during physical education classes outside, all students must wear a hat or cap. If you forget to bring a hat, there are some spares available in the staff room. Have a good weekend and see you next week. What is the purpose of the announcement? Now, read the answer choices. The correct answer is A, to remind students about a policy. Here is another example. Listen to a teacher talking to a class. It's Friday afternoon, everyone, and that means it's time to clean the classroom. Could students in the front row take the trash out to the dumpster? Second row students pick up any trash that's on the floor. The third row, you're responsible for putting everything away, and the fourth row for wiping down the tables and windows. Let's get busy. What will students probably do next? Now, read the answer choices. The correct answer is A. Clean their classroom. Go on to the next page, and the test will begin with question number one. Number one. Listen to a principal making an announcement at school. We would like to announce some changes to the school cafeteria menu. For better health, sodas and colas will no longer be for sale. Instead, we have some extra juices. We have also discontinued hamburgers and hot dogs and brought in some new choices of sandwich. Please enjoy the new foods and let us know how they are. Thank you. What is the purpose of the announcement? Number 2. Listen to a principal making an announcement at school. You have probably noticed some construction going on at the back of the school. The school is expanding and getting better and better, and as such, we are building some more classrooms. Please stay away from the building areas and play in other areas. We hope the buildings will be completed by spring. Thank you. What is probably true about the school? Number 3. Listen to a drama teacher making an announcement to students. The end-of-the-year drama production will be a story from Shakespeare called Hamlet. 
If anyone is interested in performing or helping backstage, please come to the meeting and audition at lunchtime on Thursday in the hall. We would love to have anyone and everyone involved. Let me now hand out some information about the play. What will the students do next? Number four. Listen to a principal making an announcement at a school. This is just a message to be careful. In recent days, a stray dog has been entering the school grounds to look for food. Some students have apparently been feeding it. The dog may well be dangerous, so if you do happen to see it, don't try to play or interact with it. Instead, tell a teacher so we can call the dog pound. Above all, please don't feed him. Thank you. Why does the principal mention the dog? Number five. Listen to a teacher talking to a student. Vera, I remember you played in the chess club last year, and so I just wanted to give you a heads up that it has started this year again. The club is meeting every Tuesday at lunchtime in room six o four, and guess what? They have some brand new handmade chess boards as well as some chess clocks. What is the purpose of the talk? Number six. Listen to a science teacher talking to a class. One of the most important things in the science room is safety. When you come into the science room, please put on the safety goggles, even if you're not doing any experiments. Please also remember to put on a lab coat and act responsibly at all times. Safety first, and let's all enjoy science. Where are the students most likely located? Number seven. Listen to a teacher talking to a class. Everyone, we're going to start a geography project. What you have to do is plan a holiday in at least three countries. Describe the countries, including the places, cities, and landmarks that you'll visit on your holiday, and what things you will do there. Plan a wonderful trip. At the end of the month, submit your project and get ready to present it to the class. What is the purpose of the talk? Number eight. Listen to a teacher talking to a student. I can see that your basketball went onto the roof. It's pretty dangerous to climb up on the roof, so why don't you get another basketball from the storage room? I will tell the maintenance man to pick up the basketball when he can. Don't worry. We'll get your basketball down in the next few days. What will the student probably do next? Number nine. Listen to a teacher talking to a class. I'd now like to direct your attention to the big calendar on the wall. All of the months have a different number of days, don't they? There's a very good reason for that. A long time ago, all the months had just 30 days, and so the year was only 360 days long. Because of that, the seasons started to change, and eventually summer became winter, and winter became summer. So now the calendar looks like this one on the wall. What is the main subject of the talk? Number ten. Listen to a teacher talking to a class. Does anyone know why today is a special day? It's a special day because tonight at eight o one there will be an eclipse of the moon. This is also called a lunar eclipse. What this means is that at eight o one the moon will pass between Earth's shadow. The good news is it's safe to look at a lunar eclipse without eye protection. Solar eclipses, however, are much more dangerous to view. What is true about the eclipse? Now you will hear some conversations. Each conversation will be followed by three or more questions. Choose the best answer to each question and mark the letter of the correct answer on your answer sheet. You will hear each conversation only one time. Questions eleven through fourteen. Listen to a conversation between a student and a teacher at school. Hi, Brian. I see you're about to throw away your paper cup. Why throw it away so early? Because I've had a drink with it already. I don't think it's any good to me now. You could save that paper cup, and when you have another drink later on, it would be possible to use it again. That way, in a small way, you can help the environment. But I've already used it. Isn't a paper cup a cup that you can use only once? Yes and no. You can't reuse it over and over again, but it is your paper cup. 
You could leave it next to your desk and give it one more try later. How about it? It's a nice idea, Mrs. Canale, but no one else is doing it, so I don't know why I should do it. Everybody has just one drink, and then they throw away their paper cup. Come and have a look at my desk. Do you see this paper bag? It's the same paper bag I use for my lunch every day. It carried my lunch yesterday, and the day before that. It carried my lunch last week. And look under here. That's my paper cup. I use it again and again. Why don't students reuse their cups? I don't know. But maybe they will see you and think it's a very good idea, and then they might follow you. I never thought about it like that, Mrs. Canale. Great. So you'll save the paper cup. Now answer the questions. Number 11. What is the subject of the conversation? Number 12. According to the teacher, what is true about a paper cup? Number 13. What can be inferred about the teacher? Number 14. Why does the teacher show the student the paper bag? Questions 15 through 17. Listen to a conversation between two students at school. Hi, Mark. I heard you were in the principal's office this morning. Did you do something wrong? No, I didn't do anything wrong. You know I'm a good kid, Bella. Then why were you in the principal's office? Felix said he saw you coming out of the principal's office, and now everyone is talking about it. It's not that I did something wrong, but that I did something right. What happened is the principal wants to give me a special award for helping someone. Outside the school this morning, when I got off the bus, there was an old lady with some shopping bags that looked really heavy. Okay, so what did you do? She was really struggling hard, and I felt sorry for her. She was carrying vegetables and stuff like that, so I walked up to her and I asked her if I could help her, and she was really happy. So I carried her bags for a little bit. I think one of the teachers saw that. That's really cool. They must be really proud of you, Mark. Yeah, and the principal said when the lady got back home, she called up the school to say how happy she was. So that's why I was in the principal's office. Wow, good job, Mark. I hope I can go to the principal's office someday just like you. Now answer the questions. Number 15. Why did Bella assume Mark did something wrong? Number 16. According to the passage, what is true about the principal? Number 17. What happened after Mark helped the old lady? Questions 18 through 21. Listen to a conversation between two students at school. George, welcome to the school radio station. We have a small team. There's just you and me. Last year there was also Paula, but she moved to another school. We will be the school DJs for this term. It's a really fun job. Have you been a DJ before? No, I've never done it for real before. But I talk a lot and I act like a DJ all the time at home. Then you'll be great. I have been a school DJ for two years and I've enjoyed every moment. And now that you're here too, it will be awesome. You will bring in some new and fresh ideas. Thanks for the warm welcome, Wilma. I'm really excited. I have a lot of ideas and know a lot of songs, but I don't know how to use the equipment. It's pretty easy to use once you get used to it. There's really only one thing to do. If you press this button down, anything you say gets broadcast to the whole school, to the yard, and to the classrooms. And when the button is up, then the music plays. If the button is in the middle, nothing gets broadcast. So we have to be very careful if it's at the bottom. Like the time I was talking about Mr. Francis last year. I thought nothing was being broadcast, but actually it was. We got in a lot of trouble over that. But don't worry, we won't have any trouble. We'll watch that button. Okay, great. I can't wait for our first broadcast. When is that? Our first one is this Thursday at lunchtime. You can choose the music. Now answer the questions. Number 18. What are the speakers mainly discussing? Number 19. What can be inferred about the speakers? Number 20. What might the boy prepare for Thursday? Number 
Why did the girl get in trouble last year? Questions 22 through 25. Listen to a conversation between a student and a teacher at school. Eva, I think you've got too much weight on this exercise machine. Why don't you try a little bit less weight? But, Mr. McGee, in class you said that the only way to get stronger is by lifting up heavier and heavier weights each time. Yes, I did say that. But you have to be careful when you're at the gymnasium. It's a good idea to pick up something that's a little bit difficult, but you don't want to pick up something that's extremely heavy or something you could drop. You could really do a lot of damage to yourself, the equipment, or others around you. I'm strong enough to carry it. A lot of people think like that, but sometimes when people lift things that are too heavy and drop them, it drops on their hand or on their foot. And they get injured badly, and we don't want that. Do you want to get injured? No, definitely not. So, there are two things you can do in this situation, Eva. You can either take some weight off, or you can attempt to lift it, but only with a friend helping you, just in case you aren't strong enough. You've got to think safety first, no matter what. That's great advice. So, could you help me with this? Okay, Eva. Just this once, I will. Now answer the questions. Number 22. What is the main topic of the conversation? Number 23. Why is the teacher concerned? Number 24. What does the teacher suggest? Number 25. What will the teacher probably do next? Now you will hear some talks and discussions about academic topics. Each talk or discussion is followed by four or more questions. Choose the best answer to each question and mark the letter of the correct answer on your answer sheet. You will hear each talk or discussion only one time. Questions 26 through 29. Listen to a teacher talking in a history class. In 1848, in a valley in Northern California, The American dream began with an event that brought hundreds of thousands in search of a new life. Somebody found gold. The dream? To make a fortune. Rumors of gold just waiting to be found began to pass throughout America, and many were willing to risk everything for the chance to be a part of it. By the winter of 1848, whispers of a gold strike had drifted eastward across the country, but few Easterners believed them. The gold discovery needed to be more than just a whisper, and in early December, it was. President James Polk delivered a message that made millions excited. He described an abundance of gold in the Far West. And so the gold rush began. Lives were abandoned, farmers left their fields, merchants closed their shops, and soldiers left their posts. They all went to California. Newspapers describe how fortune lay upon the surface of the earth as plentiful as the mud in the streets. By early 1849, gold fever had become an epidemic. Discussions of gold could be heard anywhere in the country and outside the country as well. Many foreigners also got caught up in the passion and were ready to make even longer journeys. Chinese, Chileans, Mexicans, Irish, Germans, French, and Turks. All traveled to California seeking their fortune. They were dubbed the 49ers because the migration began in 1849. Many never reached California, and most of those who did found not gold but bitter disappointment. They soon discovered that the image painted by the president and the media was very different to the reality of California. Gold was not scattered on the ground for the taking as they had been led to believe. It was there, but gathering it required a serious investment of time, effort, and capital. Now answer the questions. Number 26. What is the main topic of the lecture? Number 27. Whose words got the most people to travel for gold? Number 28. Why does the teacher mention President James Polk? Number 29. What can be inferred from the lecture about the gold rush experience? Questions 30 through 33. Listen to a teacher talking in a science class. Extinction is a pretty popular topic these days. 
We estimate that before humans existed, the extinction rate was about one in every 10,000 species per year. The best estimates we have for today's level of species extinction is about a thousand times higher than that, and the rate is expected to rise very sharply in the near future. No wonder we hear the phrase "mass extinction" so often. But we may be wrong in thinking that extinctions are all because of us or because of modern civilization. It is true that we have caused the destruction of many plant and animal species over the last century or so. What is happening now is our doing. But extinction on a large scale isn't a problem that started with man, and from one point of view, it may not even be a problem. So, from our perspective as humans, mass extinction is definitely a big problem, and it could end up causing our own extinction. But from the broader perspective of life on this planet as a whole, it might be as much an opportunity as a crisis. I know this sounds strange. How could the extinction of life be an opportunity for life? Let me explain. Extinction has played an active role in the evolution of life for at least 600 million years. Over this huge span of time, there have been four or five episodes of mass extinction. We believe the largest mass extinction happened about 245 million years ago. It wiped out 50 percent of all plant and animal species on land. And nearly all life in the oceans. Another better-known extinction was the one 65 million years ago that finished off the dinosaurs. But what we're concerned with is what happened afterwards. The sudden elimination of large numbers of species, like the dinosaurs, didn't lead to less biology and diversity. In fact, it opened up new routes for evolution to take. It gave some species, such as the first small mammals, a chance to climb the evolutionary ladder. Those small mammals may never have had that chance otherwise. We too may never have had the chance. The key question for us, with all the current extinctions, is whether we'll be around long enough to see what comes out of it. It's pretty hard to say whether we'll be one of the species that survives or one of the ones that disappears. Now answer the questions. Number thirty. What best summarizes the point the speaker is making? Number thirty-one. According to the lecture, what is true about the current extinction rate? Number thirty-two. What was the opportunity spoken about from extinction? Number thirty-three. According to the lecture, what happened sixty-five million years ago? Questions thirty-four through thirty-seven. Listen to a teacher talking in a class. We all like to see movies, action, romance, or thriller. A lot of movies are produced in Hollywood, and all those stories begin with a script. There are many scriptwriters in Hollywood, and they all have scripts. They want to sell their scripts to a big movie studio. If so, they might make a lot of money and become famous. Scriptwriters send their stories to movie companies. From here, an agent at the movie company reads the script. This person has a special talent for choosing good scripts. But where do movie scriptwriters get their ideas? Movies like Gladiator, Alexander, and Troy are based upon ancient history. The movie Troy is based on the mythology behind the Trojan War. Let me briefly tell you the story. In the city of Troy, near ancient Greece, there was a prince. He fell in love with Helen, the wife of a Greek king, and brought her back to Troy. So her husband took his Greek army across the ocean to Troy. But a huge wall surrounded and defended the city. In the movie, the Greek army sneaks into the city in a big wooden horse. The horse was over ten meters tall. The Trojans thought the horse was a gift, so they wheeled it through the front gates of the city. Unfortunately, it was a trap. Inside the wooden horse were soldiers of the Greek army. While the Trojans were sleeping, the Greek soldiers secretly came out and attacked the city. If a movie script is accepted, the next step is to choose the right actors for the role. When the movie Troy was being written, the writers wanted a handsome and strong actor to play Achilles, the Greek hero. They chose Brad Pitt. Brad Pitt needed to get in shape for a big fight scene. After they find the right actors and actresses, 
the movie director and other staff start shooting. Now answer the questions. Number 34. What process is being discussed? Number 35. What is said to be the first step in making a movie? Number 36. Which movie was not mentioned in the lecture? Number 37. According to the lecture, what happens after a script is accepted? Questions 38 through 42. Listen to a discussion in a science class. So, I think it would be a good time to talk about a special star. Who's heard of Beta Pictoris? Beta Pictoris is a bright star that can only be seen from the southern hemisphere. It's also a fairly close star, if 63 light years away can be called close. At any rate, it's close enough that some of our larger and more advanced telescopes can make very detailed observations of it. Exceptionally strong infrared energy comes from the direction of Beta Pictoris, the type of energy that usually comes from very young stars. Also, because it was formed only about 20 million years ago, Beta Pictoris is surrounded by a disk, which is a huge collection of matter shaped like a pancake. It is the only star near us that has such a disk. We only expect to see these disks around relatively young stars because If a star is much older, the disk would have already disappeared. All that matter from the pancake would already have turned into planets. Excuse me, are you saying that a star 20 million years old is young? Yes, that's exactly what I'm saying. You see, it's important for us to keep things in perspective here. 20 million years may not seem very young, but a star that old is really just in its infancy. That might be a little hard to take in, I understand. But remember that our own star, the Sun, is at least four and a half billion years older. Can we see any planets or any signs that planets have begun to form around Beta Pictoris? That's a good question. There are signs that something is going on. From this, even though we can't actually see them yet, Many astronomers are concluding that Beta Pictoris is well along the way to developing its own family of orbiting planets. Beta Pictoris is probably the only place that's close enough for us to observe the stages of planetary formation and the other processes that take place in the first 100 million years of a star's life. That's why it's a special star. Now answer the questions. Number 38. What is the main topic of the discussion? Number 39. According to the speaker, from where can the star be seen? Number 40. What does the speaker say is unique about Beta Pictoris? Number 41. According to the discussion, how much older is our star than Beta Pictoris? Number 42. What is mentioned about the planets orbiting the star? Actual test. Set two. This is the listening section of the TOEFL Junior Practice Test. The listening section has 42 questions. Follow along as you listen to the directions to the listening comprehension section. Directions. In this section of the test, you will hear a teacher or other school staff member talking to students. Each talk is followed by one question. Choose the best answer to each question. And mark the letter of the correct answer on your answer sheet. You will hear each talk only one time. Here is an example. Listen to a principal making an announcement at school. As everyone knows, there are some colds and the flu going around at the moment. Therefore, I'd like to remind you all to wash your hands more often. There are taps in the bathrooms as well as outside some classrooms, and we've put in some antiseptic soap for you to use. Let's try to stay healthy. What is the purpose of the announcement? Now read the answer choices. The correct answer is B. 
to ask students to wash their hands more often. Here is another example. Listen to a principal making an announcement at school. The uniform policy at school is that we wear uniforms at all times, even when traveling to and from school. Some local residents have called the school recently and noticed some of our students looking untidy. Please remember to keep your jackets on, your ties done up, and shirts tucked in. Thank you. What is the subject of the announcement? Now, read the answer choices. The correct answer is C, the school uniform policy. Go on to the next page and the test will begin with question number one. Number one. Listen to a teacher talking to students. Okay, can everybody stop working? We have got a broken bottle on the ground, and broken glass is really dangerous. So, this is what we'll do. Ted, can you go get a broom from the storage room? And can everybody else look at the ground near you? If there are any big pieces of glass, carefully pick them up and put them into this trash can. Why might the students need to clean up? Number two, listen to a teacher talking to a class. It's just about time for our class to go over for school photos. Check that your uniforms are neat and your hair is tidy. If anyone needs a jacket or tie, there will be some spares by the photographer. When you're ready, please line up at the front of the classroom by the door from smallest to tallest. Then we will make our way to where the photographer is. What will the students do next? Number three, listen to a teacher talking to a class. Today is the school's anniversary. Our school was founded 67 years ago. Because it's the anniversary, we're all going to go down to the gymnasium after lunch with all the other classes and have a celebration. The principal will give a speech, we will listen to a live band play some music, and there will also be a magic show. Are you excited? What is the subject of the announcement? Number four, listen to a sports teacher talking to a class. Before we start our game, we need to do a few warm up exercises to loosen our muscles. So, first, we'll jog on the spot for a few minutes, and then we'll do some stretches. We'll stretch our leg muscles, our hamstrings and calves, our shoulders and back. After that, we'll be in good shape to play a game of football. What will students do next? Number five, listen to a principal making an announcement to students. This summer, students will be allowed to wear sports shoes during break time and lunch time, if they're playing sports outside. Feel free to bring some sports shoes to school. However, when you travel to and from school, make sure you wear your black school shoes. That way, everyone will look very nice out in the community. Also, remember to keep your shoes clean and nicely shine each day. What is the purpose of the announcement? Number six, listen to a teacher talking to a class. The school speech contest is coming up next month. We're looking to get a student from each class to go in the speech contest. You can talk about anything you want. You will have to give a speech that lasts between four and five minutes. As a special incentive, whichever student does the speech for our class will get a very special prize. Put your hand up if you're interested. Why does the teacher mention a prize? Number seven, listen to a principal making an announcement at a school. At lunchtime this week, the parents group will be selling freshly baked cookies. You can buy a cookie for 50 cents or three for a dollar. There are chocolate cookies, plain cookies, and other cookies. All the money that gets raised this week is going to help us to buy some new equipment for the sports room. What is the purpose of the announcement? Number eight, listen to a teacher talking to students. This term during Thursday afternoon sports time, you can choose what activities you'd like to do. 
The choices include learning golf, going bowling, making go karts, and going rock climbing, as well as playing traditional sports like tennis and baseball. I'm going to hand you out a form now. You have to write down from one to three your top choices. We can't guarantee you'll get your top choice, but we'll try. Why must students write their choices from one to three? Number nine. Listen to a farmer talking to students on a field trip. Hello, everybody. I'm Bill, and I'm the manager of this farm. It's a dairy farm, which means we have a lot of cows, and from those cows, we make a lot of dairy products. Some of the cheese or milk or cream you eat at home may have been produced right here. The cows are usually milked in the morning and afternoon. We used to do that by hand, but we have machines to do that now. At the moment, we'll have around 1,000 cows on the property, and if you look over to the left, you'll see a very tiny baby cow that was born just two days ago. What will the students probably do next? Number ten. Listen to a teacher talking to a class. Recycling is a very important part of life for humans. Because of global warming and the greenhouse effect, it is clear that we have to try and change some of our habits. We used to just throw everything away, but now we are attempting to reuse more and more things in order to save the environment. At school, also, we've got a new recycling program. If you have any papers, plastics, or books to throw away, you can take them outside to the recycle bins. There's one for papers and plastics, and also for cans. We no longer throw those things in the regular trash can. The environment can be saved if we all work together. What does the teacher imply about the environment? Now you will hear some conversations. Each conversation will be followed by three or more questions. Choose the best answer to each question and mark the letter of the correct answer on your answer sheet. You will hear each conversation only one time. Questions eleven through fourteen. Listen to a conversation between two friends at school. Gary, isn't this a great baseball stadium we have at our school? Yeah, it is. I just wish I could play baseball, and then I would be able to actually play on the wonderful stadium. What do you think about the new scoreboard? I really like it, but I don't understand all of it. What don't you understand? I go to the baseball stadium with my dad all the time. And he explains all the parts of the scoreboard. It's really fascinating. I don't know. I just kind of know that the batter's name is up there and the score, and you can see how many strikes they got. But those other numbers, I don't really understand. What they put up are different pieces of information that they think people may be interested in. There are different statistics about the various players. You've got the game score, which inning it is, and so forth. A long time ago, scoreboards were manual. There were people up there who had to change the numbers by hand, and those numbers were really big and heavy. It was a busy job to do, but it would have been pretty exciting, don't you think? I do. Thanks for introducing those things. Hey, I can't read that sentence at the bottom. What is that all about? Oh, don't worry about that. It's not about baseball. That's just a message from an advertiser. Now answer the questions. Number eleven, what are the speakers mainly discussing? Number twelve, what can be inferred by the conversation? Number thirteen, what is Shelley referring to when she says it's really fascinating? Number fourteen, according to the passage, what were scoreboards like a long time ago? Questions fifteen through seventeen. Listen to a conversation between two friends. Zach, what are you doing on your hands and knees like that? Oh, hi, Fiona. I'm actually trying to get my keys back. What happened is that I was walking home from school and I took out my keys, and when I did, they fell through the grate here. Now they're down there, below the ground, and I don't know how to get them back. That's really bad luck. I have never heard of anything so unfortunate. Right. I can seem to get my hand through the grate just a little of the way, but I can't quite reach my keys. I'm a few inches short of my keys. That's frustrating. I can see your keys. It looks like there are a lot of them. 
Tell me, why are there so many keys? Two of the keys are for my house, and then there's a key for my bike. There's also a really old key that I found, and I just like the look of. And then there's a key for my grandmother's house. So these keys are really important to me. There's no way I can get by without them. I see. I've also got some accessories on my key ring. Can you see the tiny blue key light? I see it. Anyway, can I help you get the keys? I'd love some help. Do you have any ideas? I think it's dangerous trying to lift the grate or sticking your hand in. What happens if your hand gets stuck? But why don't we try to reach in with a thin stick? It's safer and there's more chance of fetching your keys. Good idea, Fiona. Let's give it a go. Now answer the questions. Number 15. According to the passage, what is true about the keys? Number 16. Why does Zach say that's frustrating? Number 17. What will the speakers probably do next? Questions 18 through 21. Listen to a conversation between a student and a teacher at school. Excuse me, Mrs. Albright, are you busy? Not at the moment, Scott. What can I do for you? Are you having some kind of problem with class? Actually, I wanted to talk to you about the book. You want to talk about the book? The science book we use in our class, I presume. Sure, what about it? I just want to say that I have been reading it on my own, and I think it's very fascinating. I'm glad you like it, but what? I'm sure you didn't come here just to tell me that. No, I didn't. Actually, I read the whole book, and it has made me very interested in science and biology, and I was wondering if you could recommend any similar books that I could read in my spare time. I'm very happy to hear this. I didn't know you were so interested in science, Scott. Actually, I used to hate science. It was my least preferred subject. But since I've been studying science in your class and with this book, I have found it to be my favorite class. That's excellent news. And it's very fortunate that you stopped by when you did. Here is a book I've been reading. It's similar to our textbook. I'm sure that if you like our textbook, you'll find this equally fascinating. Please enjoy reading it, and if you like it, bring it back, and I'll find something else for you to read. Thanks so much, Mrs. Albright. Now answer the questions. Number 18. Why did the student visit the teacher? Number 19. What is true about the student? Number 20. What will most probably happen next? Number 21. What does the teacher imply about the textbook? Questions 22 through 25. Listen to a conversation between two friends at school. Hey, Sean, wasn't that a difficult art test? Yes, it really was. I studied all night last night. I didn't sleep at all because I was trying to get ready for it, and still it was tough. So, were you feeling good before the test? Well, although I studied a lot, There were still some things I wasn't really feeling that confident about, like the section on post impressionism. That was a pretty easy part for me. I really like Van Gogh and Monet, and a lot of the artists who were a part of that artistic movement. Most of the art on my bedroom wall is from that era. Then what part of the test was difficult for you? Oh, definitely it was the part about surrealism. You know, especially Dolly. I don't know much about him. And I have never found that kind of art to be very accessible. Are you kidding? That's the most interesting part. I think his works are some of the most accessible. Take, for example, the piece called Soft Clocks. It's really nice. I disagree. Anyway, did you guess many of the answers? Yeah, I had to make quite a lot of guesses. Maybe some of them will be right if you're lucky. The good thing is, if you guess wrong, you don't lose any points. You're right. That is good news. Let's cross our fingers and hope for a good score, Robin. Yes, let's. Now answer the questions. Number 22. What are the speakers mainly discussing? Number 23. What can be inferred about the speakers? Number 24. What is the girl referring to when she says, I disagree? Number 25. When the boy says, that is good news, 
What is he referring to? Now you will hear some talks and discussions about academic topics. Each talk or discussion is followed by four or more questions. Choose the best answer to each question and mark the letter of the correct answer on your answer sheet. You will hear each talk or discussion only one time. Questions 26 through 29. Listen to a teacher talking in a history class. Lloyd's of London was the first organized insurance company, but it would be wrong to say that it was the first provider of insurance. We know from historical records that ancient merchants in the Mediterranean region went to great lengths to protect the goods they shipped. In fact, they would actually travel with their merchandise to make sure it arrived safely. This must have cost them a lot of time and money, and I'm sure it was pretty dangerous as well. So someone came up with a better solution. Sometime around 3000 BC, the earliest form of insurance began in the form of bottomry, which is a form of insurance that is no longer used. The idea was taken a step further when another type of insurance called the general average was created. Between the 11th and the 18th centuries, more new ideas came along. In 1255, a system of charging insurance premiums was used for the first time in Venice. The income from this was paid out to those traders who experienced losses during shipping. When transoceanic trade became commonplace in the 17th century, the owners of ships obtained loans from investors to finance their trading expeditions. If a ship was lost, the owners were not responsible for paying back the loans. They could be offered money on generous terms like these for the same reason that insurance still works today. Payouts were relatively rare. Most of the ships did make it safely to port. The interest paid on the loans by many ship owners more than compensated for the loss of a few ships to storms or pirates. As worldwide trade grew, so did the amount of money, and so did the demand for this kind of protection. All that money to be made eventually led to formally organized insurance companies. Lloyd's of London started around 1688. Strangely, it didn't start out as an insurance company at all. It was just a simple London coffee house where merchants and bankers often held meetings. At these meetings, insurers would offer contracts to shippers. They would write their names under the specific amount of risk they would accept in exchange for a certain payment. They were soon known as underwriters. This informal association continued for quite a long time. It wasn't until 1769, decades later, that Lloyd's of London became more than just a coffee house. That's when an incorporated group of underwriters was finally formed from the people who had been meeting there. Now answer the questions. Number 26. What is this lecture mainly about? Number 27. According to the lecture, how were early traders said to make sure their goods arrived? Number 28. What was the first form of insurance called? Number 29. According to the speaker, what was Lloyd's of London in the beginning? Questions 30 through 33. Listen to a teacher talking in a class. Most food and drinks contain calories. There are various kinds of delicious food in the world. Greek salads, French pastries, Chinese noodles, American hamburgers, Italian pasta, and Japanese sushi. But a lot of these foods have many calories. All of these have fat in them. And where there is fat, there are calories. A calorie is a unit of energy. But when you eat too many calories in one day, your body becomes unhealthy. Fat from a greasy hamburger or cheese on pizza has many calories. Peanuts also contain many calories. There are 427 calories in a half cup of peanuts. However, there are very few in vegetables like tomatoes or lettuce. That is because vegetables and fruits are mainly comprised of water. There is a relationship between how many calories a person eats and how easily they get fat. Most children in school need 1,600 to 2,500 calories per day to stay healthy. And young people like to eat fast food. If you consume too many hamburgers, chocolate bars, too much soda pop and deep fried food, you will gain weight. You might even get fat. But we all want to stay healthy, 
So when we exercise, we can get rid of some calories. Some types of exercise help burn off more calories than others. For example, riding a bicycle up a steep mountain road will help you lose more calories than walking for an hour. Here are some tips to stay healthy and burn off the calories that you eat. It is a great idea to be vigorous for at least one hour every day. If you eat a chocolate bar, play a sport for more than one hour. If you drink a milkshake, ride your bicycle for one hour. If you have some French fries and hamburger, go jogging for more than one hour. Now answer the questions. Number thirty. What is the main subject of the lecture? Number thirty-one. What can be inferred about the speaker's purpose? Number thirty-two. According to the speaker, why do fruit and vegetables have few calories? Number thirty-three. Which form of exercise was suggested as helping lose more calories? Questions thirty-four through thirty-seven. Listen to part of a discussion in a history class. Mammoth Cave is a popular tourist destination that draws people from all over America and even the world. The cave is a geological wonder, but today we will focus on a less well-known aspect of it: its prehistoric archaeological significance. As it turns out, we're sure our prehistoric ancestors knew about the cave as early as three thousand years ago. They seem to have been as attracted to its mysteries and what it had to offer. What would the caves have had inside that prehistoric people wanted? Wouldn't they have been afraid of them and stayed away? Interesting questions. If they went in just for shelter, they wouldn't have had to go in very deep. But we know that they did go far down into the cave network. Apparently, they did this in search of minerals. Primitive mining tools have been found in parts of the cave that support this conclusion. Cane torches, digging sticks, and other simple tools were found deep inside the cave. The kinds of things that would have been used 25 or 30 centuries ago by early miners as they searched for minerals and dug them out. Exploring caves is still dangerous today. But can you imagine what it was like 3,000 years ago? Gathering those minerals must have been extremely difficult and hazardous. One prehistoric miner who wasn't careful enough, a man whose crushed and dried-out remains were found along a tour route through the cave in 1935, apparently crawled under a big boulder when he met his death. But what were these people willing to risk death to find? What minerals were they mining? There was no gold, silver, or diamonds in the cave to be sure, but there were things they wanted. Two sulfate minerals are found there that could have been of interest to them: mirabilite and epsomite. We will talk about those in detail in another discussion. Now answer the questions. Number thirty-four. What is the speaker mostly discussing? Number thirty-five. Why is the cave significant? Number thirty-six. According to the speaker, what were the ancient people doing in the cave? Number thirty-seven. What did the speaker say was found in the cave in 1935? Questions thirty-eight through forty-two. Listen to a teacher talking in a science class. Now let's briefly discuss one of the less well-known alternatives to burning fossil fuels to produce electricity. There really aren't many that are totally renewable and predictable. Tidal power is one choice that does have both advantages. What I am talking about now is actually using the ocean tides to generate electricity. I doubt any of us have ever seen one, but there are already tidal power stations in operation producing electricity. How one works is simple. Tidal power plants work the same way as hydropower generation facilities. They trap water behind a dam and create energy when they release that water. Both make use of the same energy source. Which is gravity, of course. Correct. A tidal power plant is basically just a dam with a powerhouse and turbines that is constructed across a tidal flat, estuary, or bay instead of a river. The area behind the dam is called a head pond. Floodgates can be opened, and the basin is allowed to fill when the tide is on the rise. As the tide reaches its maximum height, the floodgates are closed. 
This traps water behind the dam and creates a reservoir of stored energy. When the tide drops, special ducts can be opened, and the water is allowed to flow outward through the turbine blades. This spins the turbines and generates electricity. It's unrealistic to think that tidal power will solve all our energy problems. The method has some big limitations. First, there are not that many suitable sites. To be economically feasible, tidal power production requires a difference between high and low tides of about five meters. For all the thousands upon thousands of miles of coastline in the world, there are only about forty places that regularly have tidal changes this dramatic. The next issue is the effect tidal power generation has on the environment. What do you think that could be? I can't see that it would have an effect, but that doesn't mean it won't affect the environment. Look at the hydroelectric dams that operate basically the same way. They sure have an effect. Okay, but we're talking about the ocean here, not some river. Well, there may not be much pollution, but there are still environmental issues, and they're pretty significant ones. Tidal power facilities are expensive to build, and they alter the surrounding water ecology. Removing energy from the tide by storing it behind a dam will change water circulation patterns in the head pond, and between the head pond and the ocean. It isn't hard to imagine how this could have a negative effect on organisms living in those areas. Now answer the questions. Number thirty-eight. What is the discussion mainly about? Number thirty-nine. According to the discussion, what energy source is being used at tidal power stations? Number forty. According to the discussion, what is required regarding the tides? Number forty-one. According to the discussion, what happens as the tide reaches its maximum point? Number forty-two. What is not listed as a downside to tidal energy?